All right, Jim, thanks for being here. You know, Thank we're you. Yeah, very excited Thank you for about having this. Me. All right. Glad to be here. So, one of the things I find fascinating about Blizzard is that it's, it's not just a developer, right? It's a brand all on its own. Is that something that you guys kind of consciously created, or is it something that just sort of happened? Um, I, probably a little bit in between of the, the two of those. I mean, I think, the, um, I think it's really important to understand um, the commitment that Blizzard has to its own culture around game development and appreciating that what we're producing is much more than a product, that we really pursue the development of games and game experiences as an art form. Um, from the very beginning, you know, Blizzard was founded with the kind of concept that uh, we would build the games that we ourselves want to play. And we've held true to that concept throughout all these years. Um, and we've even embodied it in some of the core principles that we use and explain to new employees as they come into the company. And among those, uh, and probably the most important one, is gameplay first. But we also have a really important concept around committing to quality. Um, and th those types of ideas are really just sort of, um, you know, embedded into everything that we do as a, as a company and, as a, a, and within our corporate culture. Um, and I think part of that also, Mike, and part of what helps us kind of continue that is we just have an amazing fan community of players uh, playing our games day in and day out. And they, you know, they keep us humble and they keep reminding us every single day why we do what we do, is that we're trying to create these beautiful works of art, these beautiful gaming experiences, to keep them playing, to keep them engaged, and keep satisfying their need for more and more Blizzard content. And what I find interesting about you know, Blizzard fans is that they are that, they're Blizzard fans. They aren't, you know, th there's some people who are maybe more into Warcraft or Starcraft, but it seems like there's a big cross-section, like somebody who plays World of Warcraft is very likely to you know, try Hearthstone and vice versa. And, and part of that's that brand, but you, know, there, you also have the Battle.net launcher and stuff like that, which just kind of makes it very easy to see all of these games right there. You kind of see the connection. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we think about that. I mean, look, we're, we, we love the fact that we have players who are you know, huge StarCraft fans or huge World of Warcraft fans. But we do want to um, like expose all our players to all of our games. We think it's a you know, wonderful portfolio of games. Not everybody's going to want to play every single one of them. But the more games we have available like that, the more it does create an access point into our other games. So through things like the launcher and through our community forums, you can discover some of these other Blizzard titles that maybe you haven't played before or haven't experienced before. And that is a big part of the way we think about um, the whole Blizzard experience, and it has helped foster this Blizzard community, right? And within that Blizzard community, there is a StarCraft community, and there's a Diablo community, but that all kind of fits together in terms of kind of being one big Blizzard family. And if you've ever come to BlizzCon, and I encourage you all to do if you've never done it before, um, you really see that come to life in, in a way that words can almost not express. It's just a really neat thing. I, mean, I was thinking about BlizzCon because it's just kind of like the great example of you guys really fostering that community and kind of giving them a chance to, you know, celebrate everything they love about Blizzard. Yeah, no, I mean, look, we are so blessed to have a community of players that, like we do, um, and we love our BlizzCon event every year because it's like a huge, huge party almost that we get to throw for our community to invite them into our home um, and to celebrate with them everything that we love about the about the games that we create and the gaming experiences that we create. And it just is it's just a wonderful celebration for us and a wonderful reminder to us of, you know, why we do what we do year in and year out. Mm -hmm. And kind of, you know, similar to that, you guys have really been on the forefront of the esports movement pr pretty, you know, early on even. And uh, it just seems like you guys are very conscious about tapping into that market. Yeah, esports is awesome, right? I mean, we're so excited about everything that we're doing in the esports space. Um, I know Mike was on stage here just a moment ago. Uh, my colleague at, at Activision Blizzard, uh, talking about esports as a business. It is a very large business opportunity. I think Mike's right to speak to all of those things. Um, but for us, you know, we see it first and foremost, maybe, um, as a great way to engage with the players and create these really exciting gaming experiences that are outside of the games themselves. Um, if you've ever been to uh, an esports event, an esports tournament or competition, there's just this visceral feel um, as people are just so excited to be engaging with, not just with, this, with the game, but with each other. There are other fans of the game, and that just creates a really compelling outside of game, great community experience um, around the game itself, so. Yeah, and you know, for someone like me, like, I'm, I'm never going to be good enough, uh, despite how much I might pray about it every night, to you know, be in a, a tournament <laughs> or- Me either, bro. <laughs> <laughs> to, to you know, comp compete on that level with some of these people, but it's, there's still a lot of value 
in that for me, and not just from an entertainment perspective, but it's almost like a learning experience. I feel like even though I'm not playing a game, I'm engaged in the game, and I'm somehow getting better. Yeah. And that kind of yeah. talks to you know the accessibility thing. That yeah. No, absolutely. It's, and that's what we love so much about it. it. It makes you feel engaged. It makes you feel like you're getting better. It makes you feel like you're connecting with all the other players around the world who are playing the same game that you are and enjoying the same franchise and the same IP and the same universe that, that we've created. Mm -hmm, right. That kind of extends out to like the influencers and you know the, the, the streamers and all that stuff, this you know, big movement. And so much of that gravitates to uh, Blizzard games. They just seem kind of tailor-made for that sort of you know, spectator experience. Yeah, no, and, and, and the influencers and the streamers out there, like, we're, we're so grateful to them for helping celebrate the game with us and creating that, that exposure uh, of the game experiences to, to new fans around the world. We think of that as a great access point into our game. So very, you know, we love working with the community and especially uh, including the influencers and streamers within the community because they really do help um, provide that awareness and access points to the game. And like we say, you know, you, you put on BlizzCon, but you also put on a lot of the esports events yourselves. You run your own tournaments. Well, why do you put so much value in kind of taking control of those things? Um, I, we think about it less as sort of taking control um, so much as um, being able to establish a very, very high level of play. Um, so we, we absolutely encourage, uh, with our games, a lot of community esports events, and we find those to be very successful. So a lot of grassroots and smaller tournament play um, actually provides a great way for uh, maybe not the top, top athletes, but aspiring athletes to, again, engage with the community and engage with the game content. Um, but then we also do, yes, throw these you know, very large kind of global tournaments um, so that you can, uh, as a player uh, and as an athlete, be the best of the best, right? And so those kind of high, um, you know, those, those high-profile tournaments that we do that usually culminate in a big world championship at BlizzCon, um, those really are the kind of the showcase events to really show you what the best of the best athletes in the world can do. And there still are the uh, kind of outside uh, esports organizations. I know that E-League is going to be featuring Overwatch soon, and we just saw their numbers with their first season, yep. the Counter-Strike thing. And that kind of now takes us to Overwatch, which is, you know, Again, it's interesting because it's the first new IP from you guys for a while, but it's still, it feels like Blizzard is the IP. And, you know, even as, as soon as it came out, there was so much excitement about it, and the launch seems like it just went uh, ridiculously well. Yeah, it's all gone great, and we're, we're super, super psyched about the reception that we've received from the player community. It's just been great. It's been a, it's been a really, it's an awesome game. I don't know if you play, but if you don't, you should. Uh, it's really fun to play. Um, the, the community has been great. The launch went off really well. It's like, uh, and you're right, it is the first new IP that Blizzard's introduced in 17 years. It's a long time. Uh, and we did pu uh, pour our heart and soul into it. And the game team has just done a tremendous job creating really just a wonderful work of art and a wonderful gaming experience. And we're, we're super proud of that. And how do you approach that from like a marketing angle with, with this new IP and a new genre, you know, a shooter kind of thing, which isn't really something that Blizzard is known for necessarily. How, who do you target with that and what's the message? Well, we took a kind of unique approach with the marketing of this game as we brought it to market. Um, you're right, our traditional audience, we haven't had a shooter before. And so we did think about that a lot. And uh, as you know, we also, or maybe you don't know, but for those of you who don't, the Overwatch, uh, when it was launched, we, we launched it globally, both on PC and uh, both major console platforms at the same time, which was a new thing for us to do. Um, and so thinking about it being the console audience, thinking about it being the shooter audience, there was you know, parts of uh, the gaming community, the gaming audience, that we haven't traditionally served. And so we were thoughtful about that as we brought the game to market. Um, so we did kind of two things that were uh, a little bit different this time than the way we've marketed our approach bringing games to, to market before, um, which were first, we did this um, very large open beta across uh, both PC and both major console uh, devices, free open beta globally. So in all regions around the world, if you had a PC or you had a PlayStation or an Xbox, you were able to play Overwatch for uh, the, better, the better half of a week for free. And we really created a lot of awareness and promotion around that open beta event because we knew the game was awesome and we knew that once people had hands on with it, um, they would love it and they would tell all their friends and family and everybody else about it. And that turned out to be a very, very successful um, way to create awareness about the game, including awareness outside of the core Blizzard community. Um, we had just shy of 10 million people participate in that beta, um, which makes it arguably at least one of the largest game betas ever. And so we were very psyched about that. That worked really well for us. 
Um, and then the second major thing that we have, we've done with Overwatch in that we're increasingly thinking about as, a, again, another access point into our games and our game universes is in advance of the launch of Overwatch, we released um, online um, and through other channels a lot of different, a lot of the background content and stories about the Overwatch universe before the game had even launched, right? Um, kind of the more traditional publishing model for games is you put all the videos and all the content and all the backstory into the box that you then sell. We took a very different approach, which is all of that stuff was made available to the broader public and promoted. Um, and we had these great animated shorts and uh, a lot of uh, backstories and lore about the Overwatch characters available on our websites for weeks and months before the launch. Um, and as a result of which, the community engaged with that content um, and started to understand and appreciate the depth in, in, of, the, of the universe that we were creating. And they got familiar with the IP long before the game itself actually launched. And in fact, even started to contribute to that IP, creating a bunch of font, fan art, talking about it in community forums and on Reddit, et cetera. So that helped generate a lot of awareness too. And that was actually really, it proved out to be a really very effective yeah, it's, way. To, it's fascinating to me just how quickly uh, gamers have been drawn to these characters. And it's like I said, you know, in the game itself, there's not a lot of story, but just through those videos, I know, you know, just starting up the official game for the first time, I already felt a connection to people like Tracer and, and Winston. And, you know, it's something we've seen before with some of the other uh, Warcraft expansions. I know uh, Warlords of Draenor kind of had a thing introducing you to the, the kind of villains in that one. And now we're, we see another one prepping for the launch of Legion, the next expansion there, right. doing sort of a similar thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we have a whole uh, new series uh, called the Harbinger series of videos that we're doing for uh, uh, the Legion release. We're really excited about that. They're very, very compelling. Yeah, as we look to the, I'm um, glad you brought up World of Warcraft because we're super excited about that. Um, the, uh, you know, the game launches on August 30th. Uh, I've been playing in the beta. It's awesome if you're a WoW player or have ever been a WoW player. There's never been a better time to get back into World of Warcraft. So I'm pretty excited about that. And, uh, you know, if you, if you if, not to sound like I'm shilling here, but if you pre-buy the game, you can play the Demon Hunter, our new uh, class that's available August 9th, and it's awesome. So I'm pretty excited about this. This is the sixth expansion that you guys have launched for World of Warcraft now. That's right. So you've kind of been through this a, a few times before. What, what was really kind of the big thought uh, with the approach of this time of, you know, retaining players, uh, keeping them engaged? You know, again, this is the sixth time, so there have been years of lessons at this point. Yeah, years of lessons, um, things that we've done better and, and things that we've done worse in the past, and we, and we continue to iterate and improve on the game, continue to hope to deliver kind of that core awesome experience to the, the players who have been with us for going on 12 years now. So it's a very, very successful franchise. Uh, and we've had players who have been with us the whole time playing this game. Um, and so yes, we want to continue to provide them uh, both the content they're, they're expecting, but also new and innovative experiences, while also making the game increasingly accessible to new audiences as, as well. So with each new expansion of the game, we see a lot of new players coming into World of Warcraft, um, which sometimes is surprising to hear after 12 years, but we continue to do it and, and, uh, and uh, been successful in doing that, and uh, just grateful for the participation both of right. the new and the existing fans. And I think one of the most interesting kind of accessibility tools is that um, kind of auto level up character that you get when you buy the expansions, which is something you start with the uh, Warlords of Dragon. That's right, right. And the you, boost. You, yeah, and I, I guess you know that was probably a popular feature for this comeback like this right away. Yeah, no, it's a great feature actually, and including if you've never played the game before, um, and your your friend tells you about it or something else, and you want to jump right in, you can boost right up to the same level that they're at as at the end of the last expansion. So you know, w and and with the with the with Legion, it includes a boost to 100, so you're able to jump right in and play with right. your friends. I remember when I first heard about this for Draenor, I was like, oh, this sounds like cheating. I, I don't know about that. Then as soon as I did, I was like, oh, I'm fine with this. <laughs> yeah. Because you know, it, it really does just kind of get you to the new stuff faster. And yeah. Even if you already have a character that's that level, it's great. But yeah, you can say, hey, I have a friend. I want him to play this with me, but you know, I don't want him to spend 100 hours leveling up through you know the original game and the right. four expansions. So. Right. Right. No, I mean, look, the, the game's you know alive and going super strong. Uh, coming off of the uh, of the Warcraft movie, um, you know, the enthusiasm among our players for the game and for the future of the game is as strong as ever. Um, so we're pretty excited about this launch. Do you think that movie increased awareness of the brand? 
The, the, the movie definitely increased awareness for the brand. We've seen a great response from the community. I know as a, as a movie, it, it uh, certainly in the Western press, it was uh, not necessarily considered the, the greatest movie ever. It actually was not so bad. Uh, and it actually was very, very well received uh, in China, of course. Um, but across the world, it's had a very positive effect um, for our community of players. Um, they've responded very well to it. I mean, if you've ever played this game and then you go see the movie, you get to see it come to life on the big screen, and it's a really rewarding and fulfilling experience. Um, but it's definitely brought new people into the IP. So a lot of people who have never played the game before, um, who did go see the movie, were then exposed to the breadth and the depth of this beautiful universe that is the Warcraft universe. So kind of going through that experience with the movie, do you think it's something you would do again? Not, not necessarily sequel, just you know, with another uh, IP. Oh, look, what, what we love so much about all of our game universes and all of the, the IPs underlying them is that they are um, uh, inherently sort of uh, accessible to expressions and other form of, of, of art, um, including uh, movies, including comic books and TV series and you know, online art forms in short form and long. Um, you know, almost whatever that you can think of, we think about potentially using our IP for, whether it's the Warcraft IP or the Overwatch IP. It's all very, very extensible that way into other forms of expression. Um, and we are always thinking about those things, Mike. Uh, when, when Mike Morheim, the CEO uh, of the company, uh, founded it uh, so many years ago, you know, we, there was a deliberate choice to call it Blizzard Entertainment not Blizzard video games, because we wanted to create these rich game universes that were then extensible to these other forms of expression, like movies. So yeah, I'd say absolutely we have our, our you know, thoughts on additional movie stuff in the future. So I have a little bit of a bone to pick with you, because you uh -oh. launched the first seasonal event for Overwatch, this summer games thing. I didn't thing. give you the scoop on yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> well, outside of that, you did it during Games Beat, where I'm not going to have a chance to play it for a couple of days. So. And now, yeah, now I'm missing out on all my loot boxes. But you know, we've seen seasonal events with, uh, with other things like World of Warcraft, and I, was, I didn't know if it was going to be something that translated to Overwatch, but it already seems like the idea is kind of working out well there. Yeah, we're very pleased with it. Like, we were really excited about Summer Games, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, we just announced yesterday. It's um, some new content, some new skins, and other uh, content that you can get through loot boxes in the game. And there's also this new mode of play, um, kind of a brawl mode of play called Lucio Ball, which is super, super fun. So if you haven't played, it's really something worth playing. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we've been really pleased with the reception from the players on this. It's been, you know, really, really exciting just in the last 24 hours. I do think the, uh, the franchise in the universe has the ability to introduce more seasonal content in the future. So uh, stay tuned. Awesome. <laughs> What's the challenge like at Blizzard these days? You guys have so many games going. And a game launch really isn't just something that you push out and it's done. There's constant content releases. I know Hearthstone's getting a new adventure soon. And, uh, more missions for StarCraft II, and I, I know something else is coming for Diablo, because at this point it, it has to. Right. I mean, it, it's got to just be crazy over there. Well, um, you know, it, uh, there are definitely operating challenges <laughs> associated with that. Um, what, what's been, um, you know, really exciting is that Blizzard has evolved as a company that um, sort of did one game at a time. I mean, it's a little bit not a, totally accurate, but kind of published and developed one game at a time to a company that now is supporting six live games in production at all times with a continuous stream of content associated with all of them. Um, and so, yeah, it does present some operating challenges, but it, it, it's kind of a first world problem. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it, it's, uh, we, we have to be very careful in kind of how we structure and how we approach that and make sure that we're dedicating sufficient resources to the production and support of each of those games. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is that we have to make sure that we're releasing those games on a schedule so that all the players in our community have access to all of them and, and uh, that they're not com competing too much with each other even in, during the calendar of the year. So it does present some new and operating and fun challenges for us, but again, it's, uh, it's a great problem to have. 
And you know, obviously, there's all these different teams working on the developer level. On an executive level, is it kind of hard not to play favorites, not to you know, to divvy up your time evenly amongst all these projects? Well, we all have different favorite games on the executive <laughs> team, and I won't tell you which ones are mine. <laughs> <laughs> but we all have our favorites, uh, and so you know, we tend to focus um, uh, on whatever is most important at the time and what is most urgent and important for the player community as well too. So really the way we spend our time is mostly about figuring out like how do we keep um, the players happy and how do we keep producing great content for them. Well, the number is now counting up and it's red just like <laughs> the Imperial, so I assume that's bad. So I think we're out of time. So Gio, thank you again thank you so much, much for Mike. talking. That was great. awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.